All right. Good afternoon, church. Nice. Happy uh, daylight savings time. Yeah. Is is there any any fans of like daylight savings times out there? Yeah. You know what? I don't know what it is about me, but I have like no idea how any of that works. I always have like Alicia uh, do it for me. Uh, I don't even know how to turn that off. I just hear this like little buzz, but. Uh, it's all good. Well, anyways, good afternoon, guys. It is such a pleasure to, uh, to be with you guys to, this afternoon uh, to be able to speak to you. Uh, we actually have a very special uh, part, of our, uh, part of the service. Uh, Robin Widener is going to come up uh, and, and lead our thoughts in communion. And so after I, I get a chance to speak, we're going to have uh, Robin come up. Uh, but also, uh, if you are a husband, if you are uh, fiance, boyfriend, dad, or whatever, make sure you guys uh, just show your gratitude to Robin before you guys leave today because uh, I had the opportunity to be, uh, to be able to serve with some brothers uh, to make, well, we didn't really make that event happen. We kind of like just helped. We were just there. Um, but it was such an amazing time uh, to witness uh, just the amazing sisters and women in our church be able to congregate together uh, and to grow stronger uh, spiritually with one another. Amen? Uh, so last week, uh, Jason supplied us with a talk about the unwilling spirit. And if you guys don't remember uh, what he talked about, uh, you probably remember meatloaf because he literally sang meatloaf for like 20 minutes, right? Uh, that although we, you know, we worship a God that longs to be with us, that he's merciful, that he's gracious, that he's slow to anger, abounding in love. And I love the way that even Jason opened that up uh, to remind us that this is the God that we serve. Uh, but if you were sitting in the pews with me, I, I realized that, wow, man, I really could turn away from God. It's so easy for me to stray away from God and to even question the things that I can do uh, for him. But I can turn away from God. And we question, you know, why would we want to even turn away from a God uh, that is merciful, that is loving, that embodies all the great things that we want in this world? Why would we want to turn away from that God, right, if he embodies these things? And I think if we turn away from God uh, and we have the tendencies to do that, I think it even begs the question, you know, where uh, do our gazes get fixed upon? Where, where do we look uh, when we turn away from God. You know, I love the illustration of uh, the heliocentric model of Christianity. Do you guys remember that? That, uh, that diagram? Uh, that we can put so many things in the center, uh, but really that's God's deserving place. And, to know, and today we're going to lean into a passage that centers around the thing that throws us off our orbit. And if we're going to guess the biggest thing in our lives that can turn us away from God, what would it be? Just shout it out. Okay, ourselves. It's a three-letter word. I heard it. Sin. Everyone say sin. sin. Sin, right? That can throw us off our orbit. And so I want to show, us, uh, uh, show you guys a scripture here in Exodus 3.15. We're, uh, we're going to read this together uh, to kind of give you an image. And even Jason opened up uh, with, with the shepherd Moses, and we reach a time here where he sees a burning bush, and he wonders what, is, what, what that's all about, right? And so we encounter when God shows his presence to Moses, and it says, When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. I don't even know. Oh, well, there's an exclamation point. I don't know if uh, God was shouting at Moses. Maybe it was like really chill. Right? But it says, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy ground. And I don't need to preach a lesson about why sin is inherently bad, right? We all know that sin is bad. But this image of Moses' interaction with God gives us a really cool glimpse. That God comes to the shepherd Moses, calls to him to give him a purpose. And in this amazing spectacle, God says, do not come any closer. 
and it sheds light on some passages that we might have read when we were studying the Bible. Remember Isaiah 59, that our sins, our iniquities have separated us from God. And what separates us from God is not this created distance, but the consequence of what happens when holy deals with unholy. Like oil and water, it cannot mix. And like we discussed last week, God aims to rescue. God wants to redeem the world. But the tragedy that oftentimes I read when I go through the Old Testament is how God had to do most of it from afar. And although God dwelled in temples amongst the Israelites, I'm certain that image wasn't really what God initially intended when he created humankind. And so today we're going to read from Luke 13. This is actually going to be the focus of our time here. And we're going to break this reading down into two parts today in hopes that we don't miss uh, anything vital. Are you guys with me? You guys ready? Amen. You know, for me, this is a really tough passage. And I'm sure you guys are probably already turned there because it consists two of the words that we don't really like hearing as Christians, right? It says, repent and perish, right? We don't like to hear those words as Christians, amen? And drafting up what to say about this, uh, this passage was really difficult because really there isn't a lot of commentary on this passage. And that's usually the case if theologians keep arguing about a passage or if Jesus was just really straightforward that, that it, there's really nothing to break down because it's so clear. But I actually found a commentary uh, that, that helped me, kind of, and this is how it starts. It says, softly and tenderly, Jesus' is calling will not hear. And that was a professor uh, from uh, Luther Seminary in Minnesota by the name of Matt Skinner. He's saying that, okay, if you want to know if Jesus was soft and tender, n- not here. So you better buckle up when you, when you listen to this. Right? And so the gravity of this passage isn't really new to us. We know the consequences of sin, and if we don't walk a path of repentance, we know that the end of our story is not going to be full of sunshines and rainbows, right? And so it makes sense that Jesus lays it down simply and plainly. And yet, although this passage is black and white, I want us to become challenged, though, in how we think about sin. That you'll see shortly that Jesus wasn't just simply reminding people to repent, but challenging them to elevate their thinking on sin, to reevaluate their relationship with repentance. And I hope that we can do that uh, this afternoon. So let's read it together, starting in verse 1, verse 5. You guys there? Amen? Amen. Let's read this. It says, Now there were some present at that time who told Jesus about the Galileans, whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. Jesus answered, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. Or those 18 who died when the tower in Siloam fell on them, do you think they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. Amen. So good he had to say it twice, right? So what's going on with Jesus? What's happening with our Lord in this story? Well, Jesus was in the thick of an ethical debate regarding certain situations, almost like current events that have happened in that time. And these weren't any ordinary instances. It almost reads like a pretty insane headline on a newspaper, right? That pilot slaughtered groups of Galileans on their way to make sacrifices to God, I would think that that would be almost like a must-read headline if there was even a newspaper back then. Maybe like it would be called like Jerusalem Times or something, or the Desert Sun. Um, (laughs) Jerusalem is a desert, so they could also be called Desert Sun. Amen. But um, So how Jesus responds to this, assumes that there was probably a disagreement happening amongst the people, probably how people usually do when big headlines come up, right? There's a lot of talk. There's a lot of gossip. There's a lot of contention in what to make sense of these headlines. But the question and discussion amongst the people 
was, did the Galileans deserve to die because of their sin? And I want to illustrate this point a bit further. You know, we probably don't really, the first thing we probably don't turn on on TV is the news. We probably don't even watch the news. Some of us may, right? But here are some of the current events that have recently occurred. So stay with me, all right? So I have three images. One, we know that guy, Vladimir Putin, right, because of the war in Ukraine that's, that's been in most of the headlines as we speak. And the two pictures next to it are, are, are earthquakes in different countries. Uh, but we have one earthquake that happened in Turkey. We all remember that, right? And the, the earthquake in Syria. And so if we remember, right, in Ukraine, 8,000 people has, have died in the past couple years. 47,000 dead in Turkey and then 5,000 uh, casualties in the earthquake in Syria. All right, so I want that to kind of, I want you guys to kind of sink in those numbers, right? But imagine, imagine this, stay with me. If we spent the remainder of this lesson or our time here together discussing which of these people were more sinners than the next. Imagine if we had a discussion or we started debating whether or not these deaths were well-deserved. If God was orchestrating this because their sin deserved punishment, right? We, we couldn't do that, right? That's a hard task. And I love how that Jesus said we shouldn't. And Jesus' answer is they aren't worse off than anyone else. And Jesus was telling people don't think you're better than anyone else. And so the question that comes to mind is really in this story, what was Jesus focused on and what, the peop- what did the people want Jesus to focus on? Amen? And why were the people in front of Jesus quick to decide who was deserving punishment? You know, Christians have had a bad rap in this department And if we aren't careful, we are capable with our words and actions to take it to a whole different level. And almost that we hold this key or this this aspect of repentance or this privilege of repentance like a weapon that we use to other people. You know, this next slide, you know, I thought about it because we've had our Strength and Weakness conference uh, this past weekend in Rancho and Riverside, and I thought about how awesome it is that we have resources to help navigate us through concepts that sometimes we may not know what to say or the answers to. All right, but I'm sure you guys have already read this, but this is a Texas pastor in Dallas-Fort Worth that leads a congregation of Christians that have openly said that, that the gay community in Texas deserves to be shot in the back of the head because of their sin. Right, And when you read the words, when you read the violence you know, some, some people have said that, you know, sinners are deserving of death, that they need to experience the swift hand of God, or they need to experience God's punishment. You know, it's a scary, scary place when as Christians we function in this world leveling with God. Does that make sense? That we walk as though we know the agenda of God, And we must push it forward. And this is an extreme example, but an example nonetheless. But this is how the world is listening to Christians today. And so Jesus here is saying, don't think that you know the intentions of God. Don't think that you're better off than anyone. But here's the dilemma. We are suffering. This world is is suffering because of sin. And we, t- we tend to take that generalization and make it really personal and make it specific. And what do I mean by that? Is that oftentimes when things happen to you, that when you endure suffering, when you endure obstacles, maybe you think that it's due to the lack of your righteousness, that it's due because of your sin. Where can that take you emotionally? Where can that thinking take you spiritually? And how does that even, how does that thinking even affect your view on others, your neighbors, your community, your relationships with people in the church and outside the church? 
But Jesus' response here is that unless you repent, you will suffer the same faith. That like many times before, that Jesus is trying to take himself out of the hot seat. Right? And so many people tried to ask Jesus questions, putting him in an intellectual, spiritual, whatever, ethical hot seat to kind of question him. But I love how Jesus here in this passage shifts the pressure on the people, allows them to think. But really the major point of this passage, and the one thing to walk away is that this passage is a call to repentance. Amen? It's a call to repentance. But oftentimes we have deterrence when we encounter repentance or this process of turning to God, that we start comparing with other people our sin. You know, my sin is bigger than theirs. I feel shameful. Maybe my sin is smaller than theirs. I'm glad I'm not them, right? And that we can start to kind of have a a, a scaling mindset. But we've got to remember that we all bear the consequence of sin. We minimize our need for repentance, And when we need it as much as the next person, and even sometimes we wear our Christianity like a badge, something to to show people that we're exempt from the wrath of God. And Jesus pulls another headline, and I love the the way that Jesus even thinks in this passage. He's like, okay, y'all want to talk about current events? I'll give you a current event. Why the Siloams? Were they worse offenders? Why did that happen? You know, this call to repentance is for all, All people is for all people. And the harsh reality in Ecclesiastes 1.9, it makes me think about uh, reading reading that book in Ecclesiastes where it says there's nothing new under the sun. And we are all cursed when we encounter sin and that we're in this vicious cycle of sinning and falling from grace and trying our best to, uh, to, to come up with God, right? And then I think in our religiosity, we start to feel overly confident when it comes to our sin. That we start to analyze sin or maybe our sin or other people's sin in the place of God. And we start to contend with one another about who is more righteous than whom. You know, I oftentimes sometimes think about that. You know, when I, when I meet other Christians, I often, that's my first thing is to compare. Like, are you really a Christian, you know, like things like that, right? And I can struggle with that. And I think about that's like our politics, our government today, right? Red state versus blue state, Democrat or Republican, right? And anytime that you turn on the news, it's always just one bashing the other side, that it's versus whoever versus who. I think it's easy in our world to start forming sides, to start forming camps, But what Jesus lays down here is there is no such thing as good versus bad. That Jesus reminds us that we are all a fallen, cursed people. That we are all cursed. But as per Galatians 3.13, and this is a great memory scripture as well, is that we know that although we are cursed, that it says that Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. Amen? But Jesus calls us to repent. And we all know repentance. We all know the word repent comes from the Greek word metanoia. Uh, But also the root word in Hebrew, shuv, to turn, right? And it's also synonymous, that root word is synonymous with uh, the Greek strepho, which means to return, right? And so that we can not only be called to metanoia, change and alter our mind, but that as sin created distance, right? Repentance calls us to shove, right? To turn, to return, right? That as sin created distance, repentance creates closeness with God. Do you guys see that image, right? That repentance reinstates closeness with God. And we may not know the mind of God, We may not know all the times, or we may not know at all what God is thinking, but when we fix our gaze on God, when we turn to God, when we look Him in the face and we return to God, we can see what God is looking at. We can see what God desires. 
that in hopes that we don't see the world in our righteousness because we aren't God, but in repentance, we turn to God and in our sinfulness, see the world with compassion because we've inserted ourselves back into our place and we get a whole view of the world differently. And our place as Christians is we are just like everyone else. You know, and I can end it here, and it could be absolutely depressing, right? In Acts 2, you know, we think about all of the people that, uh, that listened to Peter and that were cut to the heart, right? And it says, man, bro, what, what do we do, right? But I think it's good to get in a place of utter surrender and confusion. And maybe the question right now is, okay, well, Roy, if we're all cursed people, if we all are going to face the music one day, why hasn't it come already? Why hasn't God come down now and showed us a little piece of his wrath, right? But the story doesn't end here, okay? So bear with me. In Luke 13, chapter 6, Jesus shushes the crowd, says, no more fighting, let me tell you this story, and I want you to listen closely. And he says, then he told this parable. A man had a fig tree growing in his vineyard, and he went to look for fruit on it, but did not find any. So he said to the man who took care of the vineyard, for three years now I've been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree and haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should it use up the soil? Well, sir, the man replied, leave it alone for one more year, and I'll dig around it and fertilize it. Now, if it bears fruit next year, fine. And if not, then cut it down. Okay, so we see a story of a fig tree. Is it normal to grow fig trees in vineyards? No? I don't don't know. It kind of sounds weird, right? You wouldn't want to grow a fig tree in a vineyard, right? But anyways... The story is, there's the owner of the vineyard wants to plant this tree, and he comes out looking for fruit. And now we see that the planter of the tree has become frustrated of the barrenness of the tree. And I think this is an important detail, and there is an important detail because time was a factor in his decision. And The owner didn't tell the the person tending the the vineyard to plant it, and once it matures, call it to bear fruit, right? That it had to happen immediately. No, actually we see here that time was given to allow the tree to mature as much as possible. It says three years, right? But we can share in the frustration of the owner, Right, Because with any tree that doesn't bear fruit, obviously it's just taking up space. We're going to need to cut it down. right? But I love that there's a rebuttal. I love that the vine dresser comes up and says, well, give it another year. And the vine dresser then puts it upon himself, takes the responsibility to tend to the tree. And really the conclusion of the story is that if it bears fruit, good, but if it doesn't, bad. But I can get so caught up in this image of the barren tree that almost I can feel different things. And maybe you guys might share, with, share some of these feelings with me. I think when we think about a barren tree and put ourselves in the story, maybe feelings of insecurity come up, questioning, am I deserving to bear fruit? Why am I not bearing fruit? Maybe shameful. Why haven't I bared fruit already? I've been, I've been praying. I've been faithful. Maybe you hit stints in the year where you feel like your walk with God is not where it needs to be and you're not bearing any fruit. Feeling of shame can overpower you. Maybe fear. Of, Man, I don't want to be a barren tree that gets cut down. I would not want to know what it would feel like to get cut down by God. Maybe complacent. Maybe it doesn't matter the quality of fruit. As long as I got something on those branches, I'm good, right? As long as I got a little itty-bitty fruit coming out of those branches, I'm solid, right? But imagine a tree that grows tainted fruit. Imagine an orange tree, and I'm probably playing a Scott here. Imagine an orange tree, you know, that just bears dry fruit. What good is that tree? 
if it doesn't even bear good fruit. But the call in this story here is a call to repentance. The command here is to repent. But the value of this passage and even the value of this story is compassion. That even though the fruit isn't there just yet, it isn't the end for the tree, amen? But let us not ignore that there's an actual stipulation in this transaction, right? That the tree has this opportunity to redeem itself, but time is of the essence. And fruit in this story is repentance. Fruit is our ability to turn to God, to make mistakes into glory for God. But barrenness here, the feeling of emptiness, is when we encounter sin. And although we once become barren, it is believed that we can eventually bear fruit, but with the right healer, but with the right vine dresser. And Jesus here is saying, I'm the vine dresser, right? That if we're the tree, Jesus places his bet on each and every one of us. That as the dresser is willing to nurse this tree, willing to cut its branches, to prune, put a little manure, water it, whatever it makes the tree grow to be fruitful, Jesus is willing to nurse you back to repentance. Amen? Our call is repentance. And I wanted to end off our time here with a quote from Thomas Merton. It says, But the person who is not afraid to admit everything that they see to be wrong with themselves and yet recognizes that they may be the object of God's love precisely because of their shortcomings can begin to be sincere. Their sincerity is based on confidence, not in their own illusions about themselves, but in the endless, unfailing mercy of God. Now, repentance is so much more than confessing your sins. Repentance is so much more than a get-out-of-jail-free card. That Christ's blood was shed because or for this privilege that we get to share, this opportunity to repent. That repentance is so much more. And like a lighthouse, imagine that, that guides ships back to shore, God is calling you back. That you may have gone too far, maybe you've sailed your boat in a foggy place, you have no clue, left, right, north, south, whatever it is, but look, God says, I am casting a light to show you the way back home. And it doesn't matter where you are in life, disciple or not, there's no such thing as the best of believers or the worst of sinners. That sin doesn't discriminate. Sin doesn't discriminate. And if sin doesn't discriminate, why should the grace of God? Amen? Amen. Amen. So shortly, Robin is going to lead our thoughts in communion, but before she comes up, let's go ahead and pray as we reflect on our time. Heavenly Father, God, Lord, thank you so much for your Son. Thank you so much, Lord, for stories where we can see the chaos in the world. We can see uh, oftentimes where our, our human minds can take us to argue, to uh, take your word to uh, take you, God, completely taint it uh, to our own personal desires. But I love how Jesus calls people to pause, to think about what they're saying. God, in this instance, Lord, Jesus reminds us that we are all perished, that we are all destined for the aftermath of this curse. But I love how, as Jesus says this, God, he knew exactly what he was about to do on the cross. He knew the story that he was going to rewrite. Even if he didn't want to do it, Lord, or it would pain him, Lord, he had 
us in mind. And thank you, God, that as we even prepare for Easter in the next few weeks, God, that we get to see images of Jesus and his compassion. To know that although that we can be trees that don't bear fruit, although we can uh, struggle or, or, or feel enslaved by our sin, Lord, you take a chance on us through your Son. God, that you, he wants to nurse us back to health. That he wants to show us the direction that we've strayed so far. God, he shows us the way back to you. Lord, I pray that this week, God, that we can uh, encounter moments of repentance, not in a way, God, to make us feel better because of our sin, Lord, but to, to know that we have endless opportunity here on this earth because of your son Jesus to turn back to you whenever we are straight away, Lord. I pray that if we feel distant from you today, that we can come back, that we can turn, return back to you through repentance, God. Thank you so much, and I pray for everything in my son's name. Amen.